This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, ASV. It's time for This Week in Virology, episode number 243, recorded on July 23rd, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today, we're recording in College Park, Pennsylvania. State College. Well, College Park, State College. What Sorry. is it, Kathy? It's State College or University Park. I told you it was a bad idea to name it. Today we're recording in State College, Pennsylvania. We're on the campus of Penn State University, and we are at the annual meeting of the American Society for Virology. Virologists everywhere. There's no meeting where there are more virologists in one place. And joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy, Vincent. How, How are, you? are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad you could make it. I'm glad I could make it too. This is terrific. This is uh, this is becoming like you know uh, a regular event. This is a very comfortable, nice thing with a bunch of people out there. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm responsible for the weather report today. Uh, it is uh, 75 degrees in uh, State College, PA. That's 24 Celsius. Somewhat overcast right now, I think. We've had spectacular thunderstorms while we were here. Um, and some scattered showers apparently this afternoon, but otherwise, very nice. Also joining us today, our other, one of our other TWIV hosts from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's fun to be here. <laughs> guys here in the back? No. no. Cannot hear me? Let me turn Kathy up. Try, try again, Kathy. How are you? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Magic buttons. Kathy's first time at ASV TWIV, and we're not live streaming. I know. Okay. This is good. So we can relax. We were live streamed at ASM, but I only found that out about a minute before we went live. <laughs> right. I told her, and uh, I guess I shouldn't have told her at all, but it was fine. Someday we will live stream from ASV. Someday. Maybe when I'm president. <laughs> Now we have two great guests today to talk about viruses. Uh, to Rich's left from Ann Arbor, Michigan, also Christiana Vobus. Hi, everyone. Can you hear Christiana in the back? Yeah. All right. Thanks for yeah, joining us. There's, there's some. some people said no. Let's try. You are number three. Try that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Thanks for joining us. Christiana is in the same department as Kathy, is that right? That's right. Yeah. That's uh, microbiology and immunology? Mm -hmm. Correct. You guys see each other often? Yeah. Well, she's on a different floor, floor. But once in a while. Yeah, and you never see each other then. <laughs> I, we I, have multiple meetings uh, where we see each other, including joint lab meetings. So, yeah. Our second guest is from Lexington, Kentucky, Rebecca Dutch. Hello, everybody. Can uh, you guys hear you Rebecca it? in the back? <laughs> Needs more volume. You guys hear me in the back? All right. Okay. Rebecca is at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry. Yeah. So we're going to talk about what these two uh, virologists do. We have an, an audience, uh, for those of you listening later, we have a great audience. Uh, could you all open your soda cans at once <laughs> <laughs> so that people could hear you? And uh, they're eating their lunch. That's what all the crackling uh, is. Hey, listen, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. So how many of you do not listen to TWIV? You can be honest. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> One. Is that true? You better do the control. What's the control? How many do listen to TWIV? <laughs> cool. Yeah, but the ones now, they're hiding. They didn't raise yeah. their hands. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't see it. How many of you have uh, sent a letter to TWIV and had it read on the show? Yeah. Handful. Handful. Well, we'll tell you later how you can do that. Although, you guys being virologists, you may not need to ask us questions. It's probably for the non-virologists, which constitute about 30% of, of our audience. 
But should you feel that uh, you have to ask a question, or maybe we'll, we say something wrong, there are wireless mics, the people in orange, and they'd be happy to uh, bring them over to you. Okay, so Matt Freeman tells me to turn up my volume too, is that right? Okay, so I am number six, is that better? Okay. Any, any other uh, technical issues before we... How about Rich Conner? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. First thing I'd like to do is find out how our wonderful guests here have gotten here. And I don't mean to uh, State College PA, but their <laughs> careers. So let's start with Christiana. Start from the beginning. Well, I was born in uh, East Germany before, uh, at the time when there was a wall. And I grew up in East Germany. I went through high school there, and the wall came down when I was uh, 17. And uh, that was a very exciting time uh, in, my, uh, in my life. Uh, after that, I decided to come to the US for high school exchange because I needed to find out what the en enemy was about. <laughs> uh, and uh, actually fell in love with the enemy. And so then I uh, went back to do a uh, bachelor's in uh, Germany. Uh, then came to Michigan State uh, for a uh, master's degree in uh, plant uh, pathology. So I started uh, working with plant viruses uh, really early on. And then uh, um, basically couldn't make up my mind which side of the ocean I liked better. And so I went back for my PhD in Heidelberg. I was at the Cancer Research Institute, uh, which at the time was uh, run by uh, uh, Zuhausen and uh, was uh, working on adeno-associated viruses there. And uh, then uh, um, for my postdoctoral studies, I went to uh, Skip Virgin's lab at uh, um, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, I'm happy to say Michigan was interested and hired me for a position. So how long have you been in Michigan? Six years now. Okay. So, um, what, can you remember how early in your life you got interested in science? I think I have to uh, thank my parents for that. Both of them were scientists, and so I don't know whether it's one in the blood, in the genetics. Uh, Haploid. Yeah. Right. And uh, so they, uh, from early age on, uh, they basically uh, um, encouraged us to ask the questions. and. Uh, when I came, you know, with a little owl pellets and I wanted to know which bones are in there, they were okay. I had to do it in the shed, uh, not in the house, but uh, I was allowed to do it. Right. How about you, Becky? So, um, I was born in Michigan, so, um, and ended up at Michigan State for my undergraduate. Um, and I did microbiology and biochem majors. Um, I then, I had a Churchill Fellowship, so I went to Cambridge for a year and did a master's degree there. Um, and then came back across and went to Stanford um, for PhD. I did my PhD with Bob Lehman, who's a fantastic DNA enzymologist. I was, I was asking my lunch table yesterday if anybody knew the name, and we're all, young virologists might not, and then I asked him who'd used T4 DNA ligase, and everybody raised a hand. So it was a wonderful lab where that kind of research and discovery had been going on. But I worked on herpes viruses there, on the enzymo DNA enzymology of herpes viruses. Um, I then went to Northwestern, to Bob Lamb's lab, a huge lab at Northwestern, um, and did a five-year postdoc. And then, again, that lucky feeling, I, uh, University of Kentucky offered me a job, and I loved the University of Kentucky when I went to visit, so I moved there in 2000. And how long have you, since 2000, Since 2000, 13 so years. 13 years, so. And it's been, I, I love every minute of it, so it's a great place to work. Seems like this side of the table is Michigan tilting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right. So do you remember being interested in science how long ago? Yeah, so my dad's a soil chemist. So from the time we were little, that was going on. And there was always this divide. My mother's a musician. Um, so all the way up till college, there was this debate, which way do I go? Um, and, but I always loved science, and I loved watching what he did, but I was more interested in the health-related sciences. So from early on, I knew I loved science. All right, let's start talking about what you do. And I heard your talk about metanumovirus, so I thought we could talk about that because we really haven't talked about that on TWIV at all. So maybe you could just start by telling our listeners what, what it is. Okay, yeah, so um, a good portion of my lab works on a virus called human metanumovirus. Um, and it's a virus that when I talk to people, most people have never heard of it. 
This includes when you talk to medical students or many MDs. Um, but it's a virus that we've all had. Um, and the reason many people haven't heard of it, it was, it was first discovered in 2001. So um, there's probably lots of pathogens, and this would be one of them, that have been around for a long time. And you see the symptoms, and you know you're sick. But we don't know what the virus is. And the symptoms for human metanumavirus look very much like the symptoms for respiratory syncytial virus, which is a virus that we fought for years. It's a leading cause of hospitalization for children under two. Um, so finally, in 2001, uh, researchers in the Netherlands um, identified another virus. It's human metanumavirus. It is related to respiratory syncytial, but not so closely related that you have any cross protection. And it turns out it's a worldwide pathogen. It's in every continent. Um, almost 100% of the world population gets this virus by the time you're five. Um, it causes a lot of disease burden in the very young. But even though we've had it, we get it back. So it's one of those pesky respiratory pathogens where even though you've had it before, there are multiple strains and we probably get incomplete immunity. So we continue to get it through our adult lives. And it looks not like now for multiple studies, it's a very serious issue for the elderly. It's one of the leading causes of viral pneumonia in the elderly. So let, let, me, let me test myself here. Okay. Respiratory syncytial virus. Yes. Parainfluenza virus. Yeah. Human metanuma virus. Yeah. All paramyxoviruses. All paramyxoviruses. Right? They're all related to each other. And when you get things like croup, if you have little kids and they've had croup, that's often parainfluenza virus. But probably we've all had respiratory viruses where you go to a doctor and you're, you're, you know you're sick, you may get hoarse. Actually, human metanumavirus frequently causes, in adults, causes long-term hoarseness. Um, you, you're achy, you're feverish, you don't have the flu. Para, the paramyxovirus family has a big group that could be one of the causes. Negative strand, single-stranded RNA, envelope yep. virus. I've got to get that out of the way. Yes. I think yes. genomes, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Think genomes. And there's small genomes. Okay. I mean, the, para, the whole paramyxovirus family, there's somewhere between six and ten genes total in these viruses. That's all they bring in. So the, the human metanumaviruses, you think they've been around, I mean, even though we haven't known about it, like as long as these others, like forever? Well, I can tell you what I, we know for sure, and I can tell you what we speculate. So we know for sure, if you go back to serum samples from the 50s, that the, the, those serum samples have antibodies to human metanumavirus. So that means we are absolutely positive it was around then. Um, but all of the hallmarks suggest it's been around for a much, much longer time than that. Um, but it simply wasn't recognized. Um, you go, if you're, you, you have a respiratory illness, if, if we didn't have a way to detect it, there was, you would just be told you have a respiratory illness and we don't know what it is. And now we do. It's HMPV or human metanumavirus. And metanumo can replicate throughout the tract, upper, middle, it's, lower tract? Yes, yes. So it replicates throughout the respiratory tract. Um, they're seeing now, obviously, there's a, often a correlation with people who then end up with pneumonia. Um, it's primary, it's, it does not go systemic as far as we know, but the risks with other, the same kinds of risks with other major respiratory pathogens in, in terms of illness and disease. So you said everybody gets infected, so everyone in this room is seropositive. It would be very likely. It'd be surprising. The, the number's not quite 100%, but it's very, very close. All right, so we'll take your serum afterwards <laughs> and check it. But, uh, and then you said it, people get reinfected throughout their lives. Yep. Right? Do we understand why? Is it an antigenic variation or we poor don't. immunity? So I think we don't understand a lot about respiratory viruses in general in terms of long-term immunity. But in terms of HMPV, we're obviously further crippled because we've only even known this virus existed for 12 years. And there's still a relatively small number of people who work on it. Um, we do know there's multiple strains, so that may be one part of it. There's two major clades, and they're quite distinct from each other. And within every clade, there's multiple strains. So one issue may be that you may have had a clade A certain strain and then later you get a clade B. Um, there's also reason to believe that even though you've had it, your immunity may not be complete and lifelong. Um, respiratory viruses seem to be a little bit different in terms of um, our development of a long-term protective immune response. Yeah, RSV and parainfluenza virus is the same thing, right? Same thing, yeah. And it's also, I think, one of the complications, we don't have vaccines for either, in either of those, for RSV or the parainfluenza viruses or for HMPV now. Not for lack of trying in the case of RSV, but it's simply very challenging. Do, are there other animals that are infected with this human virus? So there are animals that can be infected, but it doesn't appear that they're the normal reservoir. So there are animal models. You can infect a mouse, for instance, with human metanumovirus. Um, the best, the best Hum model that looks like a human model would be non-human primates, and those will certainly be infected. 
so far, I haven't seen a study that suggests that there's an animal reservoir that we're going back and forth. So in that sense, it's different from, for instance, influenza. So un unlike Christiana's virus, yours can be grown in cell culture. It can, but it's really tough. Yeah? Yes. Um, having grown other viruses where you can routinely in a few days get a 10 to the ninth culture, HMPV is more like four to six days of very careful tending, and maybe you'll get 10 to the sixth. So it's much harder to work with, and it's much harder to grow, and that's probably one of the many reasons it wasn't discovered for so long. Um, it's, it's simply challenging to work with in general. So I have to ask, can you do a plaque assay? You can. <laughs> You can do a version of a plaque assay. It's best if you do it an immune-based plaque assay where you use antibodies to the virus to identify fo foci. So it, so it took a long time to discover it because people ordinarily culture things, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the discovery, was that sequence-based? So the discovery was not. The discovery was growth-based. And what they did is to take patient samples from, they would have lots and lots of little kids who would come in and the doctors would say, well, they have RSV. They have respiratory syncytial virus. And then they would... Um, do the tests for RSV and there would be no sign of an active RSV inception. Um, so what they did is to go back and look and say, okay, we got patient samples from kids who had all the hallmarks of RSV, but they have no RSV we can tell, and they tried under a whole series of different culture conditions to grow this out. Um, and then in just a really beautiful paper in 2001, they identified this virus. So the other complication with this is like some, the human strains of flu, it requires an exogenous protease to cleave the protein that's involved in spread. We provide that from our probably proteases within our lungs, but if you try to culture it in normal cell culture and you don't know this, it will never go more than this first passage. So that was a trick that nobody had tried before, and, and so it wasn't being routinely grown out. So it, it, are there efforts ongoing to produce or at least develop some kind of vaccine, or is it yes. too early? There certainly are efforts going on from multiple groups. Um, there's a big group at the NIH um, with Peter Collins and Ursula Buchholz who's looking at a lot of ways you might develop, develop vaccines, particularly how you might make attenuated viruses. Um, one of the concerns and difficulties with any of these paramyxal vaccines is that the history of vaccine production for respiratory syncytial virus has been really challenging. The first respiratory syncytial virus vaccines were made by formalin inactivation, which is the same way you made a measles vaccine. And those kids, when they got the vaccine, turned out to be much more likely to get serious disease when they got RSV. Many more of them died. So obviously, that meant what we understood about vaccines for respiratory paramyxoviruses was very different. And so we've been very cautious about that kind of vaccines and going much more for attenuated. But there are efforts to do it. It's just a big problem. I would guess that because natural infection doesn't confer immunity, that would be a, a real challenge. I think that it is. I think, you know, it's similar to many things like, for instance, flu vaccines where we continue to get, we get strain after strain. We're revaccinated. It's not going to be, it's a very different problem than a systemic virus to develop a good vaccine. So, so your interests, some, one of your interests, at least from hearing you talk, is about how metanumaviruses get into cells. Yes. And I found it interesting that it's really different from the other paramyxos. And when I teach paramyxos, I talk about surface fusion and attachment by H and glycoproteins. But yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so studying human metanumavirus has been a real adventure in learning how to not make too many assumptions. Um, it's very easy to think that if it's related to another virus, it's going to work the same as another virus. Um, and HMPV tends to, it looks like it's very, very different. So one of the first surprises, what you were referring to about attachment, most paramyxoviruses have two proteins involved in the initial entry. One's called an attachment protein, and its job is to find things on the cell targets or cell surfaces and bind those. The second, the fusion protein, its job is to take the membrane of a virus and fuse it to a membrane somewhere in the cell. Um, and in a classic paramyxovirus, that, those two functions are separate. The attachment protein really is the major driver of attachment to a cell. So um, Peter Collins and Ursula Buchholz had already made, when I started work, they'd already made a virus where they took the attachment protein away and you could grow it in a non-human primate. And that suggested that it's, that function of the attachment protein must be very different and you must be able to take it away. And what we found in our hands, the attachment function for human metanumavirus is actually driven for all the types of cells we've studied by the F protein, the fusion protein. The fusion process requires only the fusion protein. There is no requirement for the attachment protein, so it's very, very different than the others. And one of the big mysteries in the field now is what is the role of this attachment protein? It is present. 
It is, however, about half the size of any other pyramyxovirus attachment protein, so it doesn't look at all the same. It's much, much, much smaller. Um, but it's also present in all the strains that have been isolated. There is an attachment protein, so it seems unlikely that it has no function whatsoever. So wait a minute, going back, I think you said that uh, the Collins lab showed that the that had a virus that did not make the attachment protein, and that would grow in non-human primates? It will grow in non-human primates. The titers in the lower respiratory tract is the one place where you see a big difference. The titers were quite a bit lower there, but otherwise it looked fine. So do they have any sort of pathogenesis assay? I mean, is it, is it attenuated? Um, it did not, I mean, it seemed to cause disease in non-human primates. So, I mean, the, it, you could see, a ten, what you saw in terms of damage to the lower respiratory tract was not as much. But, I mean, they didn't, you, you're talking about death from the virus, so they were looking at a path, they were looking at what happened to different tissues and the titers of virus coming out of it. Basically, I'm not believing that this protein is worthless. Oh, I don't okay. think it's worthless at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm totally with you. I don't think it's worthless. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the idea that if viruses, in particular RNA viruses, which could very rapidly change, if all of the strains maintain this protein, there's a biological function for it. The challenge with HMPV is that the biological function we thought we understood for attachment proteins doesn't look like it's the true biological function. It, now, I would wonder if it may be involved in attachment to some cell types during an infection process, and that we're simply with this, what we've done so far, we've missed that, that it may be adjusting something. There have been some studies that suggest it may affect apoptosis or innate signaling, though there have been conflicting reports so far about that, but that could possibly be what's going on. Um, but I would completely agree with you. RNA viruses, is, I don't think they carry around non-essential genes. What, or what would be the point? They could get rid of them. Do, do I understand correctly, again, that in, in, in some viruses that have an attachment and a fusion protein, there's actually an interaction between these two that affects their function? So there's a long-term debate in the field. I'm just wireless, sure that's is that not a wireless me. mic? No, I think that's your hair on that mic, I think, maybe. Okay, I'll hold up my hair while I answer his right. questions. <laughs> Still happening. Okay, that wasn't it then. That the wasn't wireless it. mics are all off, right? Yeah. Okay, so I don't have to hold my hair the rest of the time? No. This is good. Okay. Um, so, in most paramyxoviruses, you need an attachment protein and a fusion protein for the function of the fusion protein. And the idea would be that the attachment protein finds its receptor and that it somehow transmits to the fusion protein a signal that says, I found my receptor, it is time to promote fusion. There's still a very hot debate, even after decades of research, in how that happens. Some people believe that the attachment protein actually pre-clamps the fusion protein, holds it in place until it finds a receptor and then it releases it. Um, that's called the clamp model. Other people believe that they either don't associate or don't associate in any way that affects the structure of F until the attachment protein finds its receptor and then that a binding event actually does a triggering. But for the vast majority of paramyxoviruses, if you put a, just the fusion protein in a cell, it will do nothing in terms of membrane fusion. It needs its helper, but not for HMPV. And I, will, I should say that the, the respiratory syncytial virus F protein can, do some, can work in cell culture in the absence of its attachment protein, though the attachment protein stimulates function. We haven't seen, in fact, we don't see any stimulation whatsoever of fusion activity if we put the attachment protein into the system. So the virus has a, a G glycoprotein, which mm -hmm. in the other paramyxos is the attachment. Mm -hmm. It has an F. Mm -hmm. Was there a third? There is a third. So the third is called the SH protein. It stands for small hydrophobic. I, I love for all just in the way we name things. <laughs> it's so boring. Um, basically, in the entire, uh, there's a set of paramyxoviruses that have SH proteins. Not all of them do. There's still a huge amount of debate about what SH proteins do. We really don't know for many of them. There's been suggestions of roles in um, preventing apoptosis for some of them. Um, we've done a little bit of work with HMPVSH, and it looks like it forms big, large, the transmembranes form these big, large uh, oligomeric units, which might be consistent with a pore type structure. And we do see some changes in membrane permeability if we express it in cells. So there's been a suggestion it's, it could be something called a viroporin, something that affects membrane integrity. But that's very, I mean, at this point, there's not, there's data to suggest we should examine that, but not data that I would say would prove it. Beyond that, the role of SH is pretty unclear in most systems. 
So you've, you've deleted the gene encoding it. So the, Collins, the Buchholz and Collins lab has deleted the SH gene and they can't see any difference. And we certainly have tried adding it back in diffusion reactions, things like that, and we don't see, I mean, it's not required. So this is really a good model for a fusion protein, right? Because oh, the beautiful. protein does it all by itself. It's beautiful, yeah. So one of the struggles in paramyxovirus fusion has always been you needed two proteins. Not only did you need two proteins, but the only way to, if you want to study a fusion reaction, you have to a way to tell it when to start. You know, in the lab, you have to have some way to say it's starting now, it's finishing there, so that you could monitor what's going on. For most paramyxoviruses, the only way we can do that is to hold them in the cold until you want to start the reaction, then you move everything to 37 degrees, and that'll uh, initiate the fusion reactions. That's a much more challenging way to synchronize. And so the other big advantage with HMPV for fusion is at least some of the strains, including the first ones we worked with, the fusion protein is triggered by a brief exposure to low pH, much similar to what you would do with influenza HA. So it gives us a really nice tool that we can use to start di dissecting the whole fusion process. Some of the other paramyxos encode a neuraminidase, is that correct? Yes, some of them do. Those are the ones, so some paramyxoviruses, their attachment protein binds to sialic acid. So depending on the paramyxovirus, that attachment protein will be called HN, which is the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase ones, H, which would be things like measles, um, they just call it H for hemagglutin, or G, which means we don't know what it does initially, so we call it a glycoprotein. That's why they were G. And the Hanipa viruses and the RSV and, and, and HPV, they called it G. But the HN proteins are hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. That receptor f binds sialic acid, but you also want to be able to cleave that when the virus is releasing from cells. So what does F bind to? That's a wonderful question. Um, our, for, for ours, for HMPV, the first thing we think is the attachment factor is something called cell surface heparin sulfate, which is a proteoglycan. It's a modification that goes on to O-link sugars that's present on a series of different proteoglycans. Um, and we have evidence in cell, cell culture and now in, in a human airway type systems that that's the first attachment factor. We can knock it, if we knock out heparin sulfate, we knock out like 97% of our infection. Um, we also, as having trained as a biochemist, I think if you want to ask what it, what's the receptor, what it really binds to, you want binding assays, you want to actually see, do you see a binding event? And we have the same thing, we see a huge um, block in the 95 to 97% range in a binding assay if we get rid of heparin sulfate. So we think that's the first attachment factor. But one of the other surprises with HMPV is it's, we, I think that it's nice to simplify your mind. You want to think simply, right? But I'm not, I don't think biology is very simple. That's the lesson I keep coming, getting hit with. Um, and that is I, I used to look for one receptor and I don't think there's just going to be a single thing. I think there'll be a cascade of interactions. So heparin sulfate in our mind is the first attachment factor. But we now know that can't be it. You, may need, you have to have more, because if we look at a human airway model, we know human metanumavirus only enters from the apical surface. That'd be the surface that you, as you breathe in. That'd be where the virus should come in. We can't get infection from a basal lateral surface, the other surface. But we have, there's a lot of heparin sulfates on the basal lateral surface, much, much, much less on the other surface. So clearly there are more things involved. And there's an ongoing effort to the John Williams lab at Vanderbilt has been looking at integrins and their potential roles in this. I think we may well find a whole series of things that may be involved, almost like an initial attachment and then a set of binding to get in. The um, other unusual aspect of the metanuma virus is that it requires some low pH. And again, I have this view of paramyxos fusing right at the cell surface, but that doesn't work for your No, virus. it doesn't. And, and, and like everything else, I do remember when we sent the first paper in about that, the, of course, the first comment is, but paramyxoviruses don't do that. Even though you showed it three different ways, go back and show it at two more. Um, which is fine, because I mean, you start with what you know, but this one was a real surprise um, in the sense that we really could never see fusion until we started to do the same treatments they do with flu HA for HMPPF, and then we saw a nice fusion. Um, We've got evidence to suggest that it's endocytosis. I know several other labs have got now evidence to suggest that there's endocytosis going on of some kind. Um, and I think we need to revisit that. I mean, I have the same slides. I look back at my slides from five years ago, and paramyxoviruses come in at the plasma membrane. It's in all virology textbooks. I think we would like a simple world where these viruses come in a plasma membrane and they don't need, all they need is to find a receptor there. These viruses are internalized because all they need is the low pH of the endosome. And I think the world is way more complicated than that. Well, I think- Certainly with pox viruses, you can do both. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and 
there are strains of HMPV that fuse okay, they fuse okay without low pH. There are some strains where so far we can't get any fusion at all in our system, suggesting that there's something more. Um, my, our current hypothesis, which could very well be wrong, I, I jokingly tell my students that the reason, be happy if 90% of your hypothesis are wrong, because it means you're, you must be somewhere where you didn't know what you were doing, and that's where we're supposed to be in science. Um, but our current hypothesis is that the majority of them come in by an endocytic type pathway, and some of the, it, it, as that's where you're coming in, some may naturally have evolved to take advantage of the pH where they are in order to enhance the triggering. Because we do, we still see some entry if we raise the intracellular pH. It really reduces, but we'll, just, we'll still see some. For the, for the benefit of uh, those who aren't actually here out in TWIV land, I want to make sure that we don't leave this without highlighting the incredible rearrangement conformational change that goes on in these proteins when the fusion happens. So you showed some structures during your talk. You, is this, were those structures from uh, human metanuma virus? They were not. So um, there is a partial structure now for the, from John Williams Tedjardesky that ha of an HMPVF protein is a partial structure with an antibody bound but not a full one. So structural analysis on viral glycoproteins is not easy. Um, they're massive, they've got carbohydrates, they're difficult to deal with. Um, so, so far for paramyxoviruses, we only have one, well now we have two, we have one structure all by itself, which is a PIV5 um, F protein, the form before fusion starts, and then there's a new structure with RSV. Um, that's, it's very, very challenging to get. So for what we did for HMPV is to take the sequence and thread it, working as structural biologists, and thread the sequence through their um, structural coordinates. And what we see is that the, all of the suggestions are that it's a good fit, that the disulfide bonds, the cysteines, the prolines, the glycines, those are fitting in the right places. They're almost exactly the same size. Um, and then you can do modeling to see if it looks like it's a very stable and solid structure. So it's the best we can do right now, and that is to take the HMPV sequence and use what we have structurally to figure out where it's going. So the, the prefusion structure, basically, there is, a, a, is it like flu, where you have a, a hydrophobic region that's kind of hidden? And so, then there's a huge rearrangement that yes, exposes so that? Yes, so it's different from flu in some ways. One of the ways it's, it, it's different is that, um, so the paramyxoviruses, flu has a little teeny piece that's involved in fusion. I, I guess I shouldn't use my hands when I'm on the it's okay. I'm, I hand It's okay, they can here. see your hands out there. Okay. The <laughs> uh, flu has a much smaller piece that does the actual fusion process. The, um, the paramyxovirus F proteins have a very, very long piece that's disulfide. Even though it, it's cut to two pieces, they're linked disulfide together, and there's not a clear separation between a receptor binding domain and a fusion domain like okay. FNAJ. But the thing that's the same is this concept that the thing that drives this membrane fusion process is conformational change. And it's, it's always so interesting to talk to when I teach biochem students, you almost always are talking about high energy cofactors. You know, you, if you need to do something that's energetically unfavorable, you're going to be bringing in ATP or GTP or things like that. None of that occurs. You don't need those things for the fusion process because the form before fusion and the form after fusion are at different energetic states. So if you can start or trigger the process, you're going to undergo these huge massive refolding events. And that's actually going to give you more energy because the final state you're going to get to is a lower energy state. So, and to me what's fascinating is that this thing really is a dangerous molecule. You don't want this to go off too early. Oh, no. Right? No, no. Or are you going to just fuse everything well, during a biogenesis or something? You've got to wait. You've got to have a specific trigger so that yeah. it goes off at the right time. You no, know, and that's completely right. Um, these react, because the final state is so much more stable, it is really not reversible. Um, so for paramyxoviruses, if the virus were to pre-trigger it, were to start this process in the wrong place, that virus is now dead. So for the virus, it becomes incredibly important that you are stably in that pre-fusion form until the correct time to start the fusion process. Now for us, it'd probably be nice to have ways to trigger, and I know some people have thought of that concept, could we pre-trigger viruses, put something in that allows, that forces everything to trigger because those particles would no longer be infectious. So we are in the process of writing one of those virology textbooks. So let me get this straight. Okay. All right. <laughs> so next next month we're we're working on it. So um, you believe that the human metanuma viruses are taken up by endocytosis and acidification in the endocytic pathway is partly, at least partly, responsible for 
triggering fusion yes. and uncoating. But do you also think that it could happen a bit at the cell surface as well? Um, we don't have any evidence for that. One of the things that's challenging, we were writing a review on paramyxoviruses in general. It's very hard to prove that you come in at the cell surface. Um, the general way that people did, did that was to add things like bathylomyosin that raise intracellular pH. But if you actually ask what you're asking, you are not asking if it came in at the surface or internally. You are asking if it required acidic pH for fusion. And the two are not actually the same thing. You could have something that, re that enters via endocytosis and uses other, factor other characteristics of the endosome that um, doesn't require low pH for fusion. So it's hard to say there could be fusion at the plasma membrane. I also think that in, for a number of paramyxoviruses is being revisited, there was a, a lovely paper recently from Ari Hellenius' lab on respiratory syncytial virus to, with nice data to suggest that in some cell types it's macropinocytose, which is a version of internalization, and that that's how it does its entry. So I think it's one of those examples where there's a lot of times you think as a field you know something, and then when you start to go back and look at it, you realize, well, actually, we don't know that for sure, and then you have to start revisiting. And I think the question of where entry occurs probably needs to be revisited for paramyxoviruses. So basically, in our textbook, we should have an asterisk. That would work, yeah. A Roger, a Roger Maris asterisk. I don't know if anyone remembers what that is. But uh, at the bottom saying, some of the paramyxos don't do this, right? Or at least saying that, the, you know, there's, there's evidence that some of them may be able to use both internalization also. We like to use text boxes to, as, as off-side things that aren't related, that don't interrupt the flow. We yeah. can put something in there. This one is different. Yeah. I wanted to ask you one more thing, that you, and it relates to what you talked about at the end of your talk, this little mystery. Oh, yeah. Can you t is, is that something you can talk about? Oh, sure. I mean, I put it up on a slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but remember, this is going to millions and millions of people. <laughs> Well, not millions, maybe. And they will all now go out and use it to write papers and submit <laughs> grants, I know. Uh, no, it was, we, it's what I was thinking of the, the, the idea we were, you know, we're supposed to be sharing our, our information and discussing and getting ideas. And so one of the interesting things we've, some of our work's been on assembly of HMPV, and I didn't have a chance to talk about that here. Um, but as we've been looking at infection cultures, particularly in those from respiratory cells, human respiratory cells like BES, 2Bs, um, we'll find late in infection that these very long filaments um, are now form, they've formed or were preformed and we couldn't see them, but we have now these long filaments between cells that contain all of the viral proteins that we can stain for. Um, they're different from the filamentous budding virus because we can see that coming off too. You can see small filamentous budding virus that contains all the right things too, but you also see these long extended filaments between cells um, and they will often go by an, infect, an uninfected cell and then later on that cell becomes infected. I put it up not because, I mean, obviously, that doesn't prove in any way that the filament was a new way of spreading virus, but it's interesting because there are fields like the herpes virus people work on cells, this, this type of cell-cell spread. I wanted to get feedback, and I've gotten lots of wonderful comments and suggestions. Have you tried this? Look at that. Um, I was trained in an environment where the idea was you want to share as much as is earthly possible because everybody else's ideas will help inform your ideas. And so I figured it was a fun thing to put up and get some discussion on. That reminded me very much of the pox virus yes. thing, where it makes, yeah, it induces these processes that actually deposit virus on other cells. Right, and you know, for it's not something that's been thought much for respiratory viruses, but I've been doing more thinking in the last um, year or two just about the environment respiratory viruses have to deal with. You know, it's pretty horrible. Now that you do, we do these little cultures, you know, you have to slog off the mucus that's being put out in order for the, and wash it and clean the cells as you're doing infections. Viruses that come in through the respiratory tract have a mess to get through. So if there were additional ways that they could get help going from cell to cell once they found that first target, it would be lovely. Now, obviously, it may not turn out to be correct, but the idea was just to propose it, get suggestions, get ideas, so that's something we can all start looking at. Thank you, Becky. Now, since everyone's finished eating, you hear how it got quiet? You, all that chewing is yeah. gone. Now that we've eaten, we can talk about gastroenteritis. <laughs> <laughs> And um, you, you showed on your first slide the other night a quote from a British newspaper. Can you recite that? Um, it had puking virus in it. The puking bug, uh, norovirus, uh, effortless, 
continues to uh, squirm through the population effortlessly transforming ordinarily carefree human beings into spluttering sulfurous geysers of molten waste. <laughs> <laughs> That's Very great. good. Sulfurous geysers. Yeah. So that was, the, that was from the British Guardian uh, early in uh, January when uh, there was a huge outbreak of norovirus in the UK. So um, we, we actually talked a long time ago about norovirus. We have 134, over 100 episodes ago, with your colleague Stephanie Karst. The two of you were in Skip Virgin's lab together. Correct. Right? Yeah. And, but it's a long time ago, and we need an update. Right? Stephanie here? No. Nope. She was earlier. She was around somewhere. OK. Yeah. Maybe she's doing a lunch thing. Right. Um, so when, was, when were human noroviruses identified? So the, the very first identification was in 1972. There's a paper from Al Capikian, uh, and uh, that was the first time that we uh, had, uh, that he took uh, EM images of the uh, viruses, uh, and he used a sample from an outbreak in uh, Norwalk, Ohio from 1968. Norwalk, Ohio, not Norwalk, Connecticut, as Dixon no. has right. said, right? Norwalk, Ohio. Okay. In the 1970s, and it hasn't been able to be cultured since then, right? That is correct. That is our holy grail in the field. <laughs> Do you have any hope that it will one day be culturable? Of course. We have to be optimists, right? There you go. Someone said in one of the talks, uh, just never give up, right? I forgot that. Um, why, do you have any idea what is the block? Well, so... Uh, the initial idea and all of the cultural attempts up to date, uh, or most of them, uh, have focused on the uh, intestinal epithelial cells. Because if humans get diarrhea, then uh, um, the virus uh, might be replicating uh, in those cells. Uh, and the more data that we accumulate, uh, I think uh, there's more and more evidence suggesting that that uh, cell type, uh, there might be other cell types that can also be uh, infected. Uh, in particular, the, uh, um, what we have learned from murinor virus uh, is that it infects uh, macrophages and uh, dendritic cells in the intestine. And uh, there's some evidence from other uh, um, large animal models that can be infected with human norovirus that in those settings uh, there's also cells in the lamina propria that get infected and so uh, that you just, is definitely. Could you just explain what the lamina propria is for the listeners? So uh, the lamina propria is if you think of the intestine you're probably uh, uh, thinking of the villi that, uh, that stick out uh, and uh, increase the uh, absorption. Uh, and within, underneath the intestinal epithelial layer, there's, uh, there's this region that's called the lamina propria. Within it, uh, there are macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, and B cells that uh, roam around. Uh, so the immune cells basically uh, are underneath the intestinal epithelial uh, cell barrier. Okay. So uh, in, in the mouse, you can show that mouse neurovirus replicates in dendritic cells and macrophages. Right. The, are these within the lamina propria? Yeah, so we've seen, we've seen antigen-positive staining in the lamina propria as well as in the peos patches where these are lymphoid uh, um, organelles that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, immune cells uh, present. So I want to briefly review this the mouse norovirus model. This was, you discovered this as a postdoc in, in Skip Virgin's lab, is that correct? Right, how together that, with Stephanie. How did, how did that come up? Well, so uh, when both Stephanie and I were hired to, to find new viruses, and Skip had a collection of clinical samples uh, that uh, um, from uh, um, the spinal fluid uh, of people that uh, they couldn't identify any infectious cause. And so uh, we went in, we tried it, and our control mice uh, ended up being uh, infected also. And so it was one of these uh, um, nice surprises in science that uh, is always, uh, I think, one of the fun parts of science. So this is, a, this is a virus that you can culture, right? And you can infect mice and you get a pathogenesis that pretty much mimics the human disease, or at least in some ways does? It, uh, uh, it does not. Uh, so murinor virus, uh, mice don't vomit. 
so there is no vomiting involved, which we see in humans. Mice, and don't, well, mice don't ever vomit, is that they what They don't ever vomit. They just don't have the physiological <laughs> reflex uh, to even, do that. Even if you give them alcohol, they don't vomit. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's no reflex, so they lack the, uh, the reflex for that. But we also, at least in an uh, immunocompetent wild-type mouse, we don't see diarrhea. Okay, so you have to use a, like an interferon knockout mouse? Interferon knockout, stat uh, one knockout. Uh, so if you, uh, if you knock out uh, portions of the innate immune system, then you can uh, see signs of diarrhea. Okay. All right, so if you take a uh, human neurovirus, and this is hard because you have to have filtered fecal extracts, right? Correct. And put them onto human macrophages or dendritic cells. It doesn't replicate. So there's one uh, nice study by Mary Estes group. Uh, they have tried it with uh, PBM studies. So macrophages and dendritic cells uh, from the blood. And in those, uh, there's... An, I think 0.1% of the cells, uh, they saw some immunostaining, uh, but uh, it wasn't uh, spreading through the culture. So they concluded that at least the PBMCs uh, cannot be infected. So what do you think? Is there something missing in the culture? Are they got the wrong cell types still? or? Well, there's a possibility because the PBMCs are so different uh, from the um, immune cells in the intestine, because okay. there's, a, there's a lot of specialization that, uh, that it's that. Um, I mean, uh, eventually, I think we'll try and go through all the cells that are in the intestine to one day find one cell that can support it. Uh, and in addition, you might have things that uh, proteases that are in the intestinal content are required. That at least is the case uh, for a porcine enteric Khaleesi virus cell culture model. So besides the intestinal epithelia and the, the cells in the lamina propria, what are the other possible cell types in the intestinal tract? Those are the two main populations. So those, uh, um, I think uh, that's the next step is to, uh, to look at these uh, immune cells in the intestine. So um, do, you, do you have any clue whether it's, a, it's an entry defect or a a post-entry defect? I assume those experiments have all been done. So the virus can bind to many different cell types, um, and that's presumably mediated by the binding these viruses to carbohydrates, uh, which are important uh, for the attachment. Uh, and then uh, if you transfect viral RNA into any cell type, you can get uh, replication and virus particles uh, being released. In case of MNV, uh, we've shown uh, that it can also be, uh, that those particles are, that are being made are infectious as well. Um, Mary Estes group has done it for human norovirus, but obviously they couldn't test whether the particles uh, that are being released are the infectious particles. No, I guess no graduate students or med students have signed up uh, for that one. Uh, Which I was going to ask you that, if you have done the, the experiment yourself, have you drunk the Kool-Aid? <laughs> <laughs> I always uh, ask my students when they join the lab if they want to become test subjects, but so far no take -offs. Do you offer them money? <laughs> right, that's, that's the key. Um, that, that's what they do How for... How much? <laughs> uh, well, my understanding is if you're, you do a weekend experiment for $300, right? Yeah, that, that's when, when uh, the volunteers are, uh, you know, when, when people volunteer for those studies, yeah. Yeah, Skip Virgin tells that story wherever he gives a talk. You come Friday, they infect the medical students, and by Monday, they're ready to go back to class. Right. right. So, but you have not done that, right? We have not done that. No, we like the mice. Uh, they're, they're much more agreeable. Uh. So one of the... One the of mice the, don't charge as much either, right? right. <laughs> mice are cheap. So uh, actually, they're not so cheap. Right? Yeah. No. Not anymore. Uh, one of the things you talked about was making a a mouse model for uh, human norovirus. And in fact, this was just published in uh, mBio, right? Correct. So can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so it basically started with the idea that if the uh, intestinal epithelial cells uh, um, on potentially not the cell type replicating the virus, and uh, um, if it's instead the uh, cells in the lamina propria, and the, um, then if we can have a mouse that has human immune cells uh, 
those mice uh, could become infected. Uh, and so in order to test that hypothesis, uh, we uh, got help from uh, um, Ramesh Akina's lab at Colorado State University who uh, makes humanized mice by taking uh, CD34 positive uh, stem cells and injecting them into uh, irradiated uh, rag gamma chain knockout mice. Uh, and it so, so these CD34 uh, positive stem cells are human cells? These are human cells. And what does uh, the CD34 positive tell you? Or what, does, what class of cells does that make it? It's in, it's in uh, the early stem cell uh, population. Okay. And so these cells have the capability to then uh, differentiate into uh, the immune cells, uh, the dendritic cells, the macrophages, the T cells, and the B cells. And in fact, if you go into the mouse, you can then see that uh, um, those uh, cells uh, of human origin, and uh, in most cases, uh, there's also a few cells of mouse origin that are left. And so what's the significance of the genetic background of the mice? That's a, uh, um, there are two answers to that. So the first is uh, we demonstrated that you actually do need the immunodeficiency. So you cannot infect a wild type mice. Because one of the surprising uh, things uh, that we found is that the human immune cells were actually not uh, the critical factor in this. Uh, so when we infected the humanized mice, we had a control group of non-humanized mice, and those became infected also. It's just like your skip virgin days, right? Yes, it's right. like, you, you, <laughs> and, and it's what Rebecca said, right? You have, have an assumption of what you think is going to work, and it's the opposite. Uh, that but these out. are rag knockout mice, is that right? They're rag knockout and common gamma chain knockout. Okay, so uh, what, is, what does that mean in terms of their uh, immunity, those mice? These mice are deficient in T cell, B cell, and NK cells uh, in their responses. Ah, so uh, they're immunologically hurting. Do they have anything? They still have, uh, they still have uh, uh, the rest of the innate immune response. They still can make interference. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and so then these, uh, in these uh, non-humanized mice, uh, as long as you have that deficiency, you can infect them. But it also has to be on a BALP-C background. So these uh, um, commercially available are only rag common gamma chains on a B6, B10 background. And we thought, you know, if we can use a commercially available mouse strain, it would uh, make this model much more acceptable or accessible to anyone in the field. And so we tested those mice, and there was an next surprise. Uh, they did not uh, become infected. Uh, and so there's also something about the uh, murine background that is important. So when these mice get infected, do they get sick? No. So we had one single mouse uh, in our humanized mouse cohort that had diarrhea. But in retrospect, uh, that uh, because it was not consistent, uh, it must have been something else. But they shed, do they shed virus in the feces? That's, that was the next surprise. So the, uh, when we infected the mice initially, we decided to go in, uh, you know, uh, both by the oral route and the intraperitoneal route, just because uh, if, we can't, if we hit them with all we can, and they don't get infected, then we don't have to uh, move forward. Uh, and so we did that. When we later on went back to separate those two routes, it turned out that uh, the mice became infected only after the uh, intraperitoneal route and not the oral route. And when you now look at those mice, we actually do not see shedding uh, into the feces. But where does, uh, does the virus make its way into the intestinal lumen, or does it remain in the lamina appropriate? So where, the, um, where we see virus genome titles in the tissues is actually throughout the uh, intestinal tract, but also in systemic sites. So the, the virus will go to the mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, lung, liver, spleen. So it goes, uh, it goes uh, systemic. And then when we use immunohistochemistry to look for viral antigen, we see it in uh, macrophages in the places that we have looked is uh, in liver, spleen, and intestine, and it's in macrophages in those. Okay, so that, that works to support this whole idea that it's the immune cells that this, the, this virus likes. 
That's, that's what we think, yes. I seem to recall, I, I just had a quick look at this paper, and do I recall correctly that you got out of this a genotype that you didn't know was there when you put it in, as if the, the infection grew out a, 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 a small fraction of virus? Uh, I well, there, was, there was one case. So initially, because we don't have cell culture grown virus, uh, the only infectious virus we have is people donating poop and then uh, us filtering the poop and uh, giving it to the mice. And so um, because there's a lot of genetic diversity in the human noroviruses, uh, we decided to initially to infect with pools of virus. Uh, we had genotyped uh, those pools uh, in the uh, in one case of the humanized uh, mice, we had, uh, you know, we had genotyped it, uh, what we uh, put into the mouse, and then we genotyped what came out of the mouse. And one of the genotypes we didn't detect uh, in the input, but there was something in the output. So the mouse no. is selecting for something. Well, so that was our initial experiment when we went in both oral and IP. And so uh, in that uh, experiment, uh, looking at it, you know, in retrospect, now that we know that only the IP route is, uh, is infectious, and what the viruses that are coming out in the feces are essentially, you know, input, what we think happened is that there was, uh, in the input, uh, we actually had that genotype present. It was just below the limit of detection. Okay. So, um, in human neurovirus infection, is there systemic virus? Um, it has not been directly addressed, but there are um, cases uh, where people have neurological symptoms, uh, you know, benign seizures in children, and so there's a possibility that, uh, that the virus might uh, also have a viremic phase. That may be related to the uh, immunocompromised nature of the mouse also, right? Oh, yeah, that, that in our case that it goes systemic, that uh, could certainly be, yeah. So the, this, the, the fact that you can get replication in mice shows you that you can grow human neurovirus in some cell type, whatever it is in the mouse that it's growing in, right? Yes. Can you grind up the mouse and make a stock now of virus instead of having to use human stool filtrates and reinfect new mice? That's what my postdoc uh, is doing uh, right now, although... So he's here uh, sitting in the audience, so uh, Ola is doing the experiment uh, okay. as we speak. So that presumably would be one way to have more virus, and then you could passage it from mouse to mouse and see if that improved. Right, uh, and that's one hope of improving the model is to passage the virus, adapt it to the mouse so that uh, there's a more robust uh, right. phenotype. So I guess the idea is that in a, wild, uh, a mouse with an intact immune system, there's, there's not enough virus produced to overcome immune responses, and that's why you have to take away the immune res response to allow the virus to replicate. Right, right, that's but the answer. Maybe if someday you had a, a, a more robustly replicating virus, Bert, is that how? Robust, right? <laughs> um, then you could put it into wild-type mice as well. Potentially, maybe, right? right. So, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just, you know, whenever I think of noroviruses, I go back to when my kids were young, okay? <laughs> and we had at least an annual event where I'm camped out with my kids overnight and everybody's throwing up, okay? And I had three little kids and it goes through the family. Can you identify with this? Year after year, okay? Yeah. So why does it come back? I mean, those, uh, most of those I figure were norovirus infections. Right, What's the right. problem here? Well, so the, the problem is twofold, and it really uh, uh, reminded me when Rebecca was speaking, we have a lot of genetic diversity. Um, there's hundreds of strains of human norovirus uh, that have been sequenced. And uh, uh, volunteer studies in the 70s have shown that there's only a, a short-term protective immunity. So people uh, within the first half year, if they got challenged with homologous virus, they were protected. If uh, those same people were challenged uh, we, uh, a year later, they uh, came down with it again. So vaccine's gonna be a problem. They are, um, 
we could uh, do an annual uh, vaccination. Okay. <laughs> what is, uh, in this audience, what is the seroprevalence of norovirus? We could do that experiment with the same serum. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is uh, about uh, um, so one of the genetic susceptibility factors that people have found for human noroviruses are these histoblood antigens, and uh, these are the carbohydrates that are on your red blood cells uh, and make you A, B, or O um, blood type. But they are also uh, found on the intestinal uh, epithelium. And uh, depending on the strain, they have picked certain of these uh, carbohydrates to uh, uh, presumably uh, um, you know, infect the host. Uh, and so it depends on, uh, on a strain-to-strain -strain basis. There are always uh, people that cannot be infected with that given strain. Unfortunately, uh, if you look across the whole diversity of human noroviruses, Everyone gets it. Okay, so everybody. It's just like metanumoviruses, yep. right? And that's why we picked these two virologists today <laughs> as an example. Anybody have any questions before we move on here in, in this last part? I just want to make a comment. So this paper that uh, is describing this work that Christiane is talking about was the first author was, uh, was Stefan Taube, who was mm -hmm. your host when you came to University of Michigan. Right. Um, and uh, it's published in mBio, which is an open access journal. Probably most of the people in the audience, open access journal is the same as getting any other PDF from your library, but there are places or, and people who don't have that access. So it's uh, something to, to know about. So the other authors are um, Ola, who, men who Christiana mentioned, uh, Ola Kolowol, Herna Wilkinson, Handley, Jeff Perry, Larissa Thackeray, Akina, and Christiana. Thank you. There was a question over there. So I was really struck by the last uh, talk of the last session about the commensals, bacteria, and, uh, and viruses. And in the light of that talk, uh, and your virus, and your virus, would you expect that if you infected my, uh, actually not with a filtered virus, but in the presence of those commensals, hmm. would you uh, then actually see more viral replication? That, uh, so I, I did not hear the last talk uh, because we were, uh, we were doing sound checks, uh, so, uh, um, but uh, there's also, uh, you know, that it was probably based on a couple of science papers uh, by Julie Pfeiffer's group in addition to uh, Tatiana's work, uh, and uh, it, uh, um, those experiments remain to, uh, you know, be done for the uh, norviruses. Uh, um, and I believe that uh, Skip Virgin's lab is beginning to, uh, to look at that. Uh, um, but uh, I don't uh, uh, have all the uh, insights uh, in that. Uh, but uh, knowing Skip, it, it will be published. <laughs> you don't have the inside poop. I don't know that. No. <laughs> I'm just being Alan Dove. Right. right. All right, well, before we wrap up, any other questions? I think that's, uh, before we wrap up, we want to do three picks of the week for you um, because it's a fun part of TWIV. And Kathy, what, what do you have for us today? So some of you know that I've in the past picked Vihart, who has really cool mathematics videos. Um, if you haven't checked out, it's V-I-H-A-R-T. It's really well worth checking out. Um, and this is just another mathematical one. I can't remember where I found it, but, uh, it's uh, how many orders would there be if you, to shuffling a deck of cards? And it goes through a nice explanation of it, but basically it's 52 factorial. So 52 times 51 that's, and so forth. So how big is that number? That number is 68 digits long. It's basically 8.1 times 10 to the 67th. So the question that's being asked is, uh, how many different orders are there, and um, how many times have cards been shuffled in human history, and has, you know, have, has there ever been a repeat shuffling? Um, and so uh, they do this calculation of how many, uh, yeah, how many, if you had everybody in history ever shuffling cards all the time, and they do this, you know, sort of back of the envelope calculation, um, you multiply it all out, it comes out to be 1.5 times 10 to the 23rd, uh, uh, times the cards could have been shuffled in history. 
And so uh, it's pretty safe to say that the particular order that this person has on the website uh, that he got uh, is unique. And it's just a really fun mathematics thing to see. And then I haven't been to his main page, but um, he may have other mathematical things too, kind of like by heart. Wow, more than the total sages in the oceans. <laughs> wow, that's great. Thank you, Kathy. Rich, what do you have for us? So I'm going to credit Colin Parrish for this because uh, he's my Facebook friend and he posted this on Facebook yesterday and it <laughs> caught my attention in particular uh, in the context of this meeting. This is a Scientific American uh, blog. It's a guest blogger, Radhika Nagpal. I'm probably butchering the name, but the title of the blog is The Awesomest Seven-Year Postdoc or how I learned to stop worrying and love the tenure track faculty life. <laughs> so she is a uh, professor uh, uh, in the computer science department at Harvard. And this is a blog about how to basically deal with the stress of being a junior faculty member at a university. And this is the kind of thing that we talk about I mean, we have workshops, right, at ASV on career development and how to deal with all of the different uh, stressors and things that come along in your career. And I thought this was just a really good blog. And just to summarize her she had bullet points of her, I think, seven different points. One, I decided this is a seven-year postdoc. Two, I stopped taking advice. Three, I created a feel-good email folder. Four, I worked fixed hours and in fixed amounts. Five, I try to be the best whole person I can. Six, I found real friends. S seven, I have fun now. Uh, so, you know, this is worth reading. This is really worth reading. It's what kept me up late last night. Uh, it's, she's got some really good insight about just how to, how to do things and how to keep your life in balance, I think. Nice. Thank you, Rich. Uh, my pick is a microbe world video. It's actually an interview, a video interview I did uh, back in May in the UK with Dave Bella. Dave Bella is a structural virologist over uh, at the MRC in Glasgow, and he talks about why he got into doing this, and also he does a lot of science outreach at the Glasgow Science Center, and he talks about some cool ways that he teaches science uh, to people who go to the museum. So it's about a 15 minute video, check that out. We also have a listener pick, this is from Judy, who writes, since you all do such a wonderful service sharing your knowledge about science and making the world more science literate, and your wonderful, fun, and educational off-topic conversations cover so many different aspects of science, I wanted to share this article with you. It comes from Project 2061, the date chosen for the next visit by Halley's Comet, which is a group dedicated to improving uh, science Literacy, and this is called Reading for Science Literacy by Joellen Roseman, the director of the AAAS Project uh, 2061, and that's a short article. Thanks for all you do. Uh, Judy is a high school science teacher in San Diego, and underneath she writes, impatiently waiting for more podcasts. I just think it's cool that we have science teachers listening to us. Judy's written many times before and told us that she uses us uh, for her professional development, because in California there's no money for professional development for <laughs> high school teachers. <laughs> so this episode of TWIV will be at twiv.tv and also uh, on iTunes. And if you like what we do, one of the ways you can help us is to go on over to iTunes uh, and rate the show, and it helps to keep us visible in the iTunes uh, directory. And of course, if you have any questions and comments, please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Christiana Vobis is at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Becky Dutch is at the University of Kentucky. Thank you, Becky. It was a pleasure. Um, Kathy Spindler is also at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, this is fun. And Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing, Vincent. It's always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Virology especially the council for letting us do this again, the education committee, it's part of their activities, and also local organizers here at Penn State, Dick Frisk and Anthony Schmidt. And of course, thank, thanks to this great audience, the room is pretty much full, and we really appreciate your interest 
in, in what we do here. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.